Hello and welcome to this edition of Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today we're going to talk about audiology and how basically the ear works. Today joining us is Tracy Ackerman, who's an audiologist from Purveya Health and Purveya Audiology, obviously. Tracy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, just to start off with some of your background, how long have you been in the field of audiology? I've been practicing for over 20 years. Most of my career started in Ohio, where I'm from, and the last 10 years have been here in Sheboygan. Okay. What type of an educational background do you have to Back when I was proceed? in school, we had to get our four-year bachelor's degree, and then mm -hmm. we had to go on to get a two-year master's degree. So I have a master's of audiology. A few years ago, they did change the requirements, and they require you to have a doctorate of audiology now, but that's just the last four years that have been requiring that. Okay, so do you yourself have a doctorate or is that something you I don't have a doctorate yet. Okay. I have a couple kids to put through school first. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'll consider it. Okay, I know I've always wanted to go back for my master's, but it just hasn't happened yet. Yeah. You know, someday maybe. Um, how long have you been in the area? You said just about, two just years? about 10 years. Oh, 10 years mm -hmm. in the area here in mm -hmm. Sheboygan. How long with Purveya? Same. Um, well, I worked for Dr. Campbell originally and then okay. we merged with Purveya about four or five years ago. Okay. So I've been with Purveya about five years. We practice in Sheboygan um, on Taylor Drive at the Purveya Sheboygan site. And I also spent a few days in the Purveya Health Center in Plymouth. Okay, wonderful. The study of audiology, what is it, how does it work, how does the ear work? Can you give us for our, for our viewers a little background? Sure. Um, the study of audiology is basically the prevention, the identification, and the treatment of various types of hearing losses. And I also work with some balance disorders. So that if the balance problem is due to the vestibular system, which is the balance organ itself, then I would be the person that you would call for that. Okay. Over the years, how has the study of audiology changed? Well, the biggest thing, I think, besides the degree change and requirements there would be a lot of the study of audiology has been integrating the study of hearing loss with other disorders in the body. So a lot of the study, not only have we done a lot of changes in technology and hearing mm -hmm. aids, but also they've been doing tons of studies these days when they're linking dementia, fall rates to hearing loss, associating diabetes with hearing loss. So one of the biggest changes in audiology is really associating us with other disorders and other specialties. Okay. As far as audiology, for hearing loss in today's um, population, has the rate of hearing loss gone up or gone down? And what's the age of people that have yeah, It's absolutely gone up quite a bit. Really? Uh, 31 million Americans have hearing loss. And more than 60% of those patients that have hearing loss are under the age of 65. So majority of our patients are actually under retirement age. One in five teenagers have hearing loss. So we're seeing that's the greatest population that's changing is we're having more and more kids with hearing loss because they're wearing their iPads or their iPhones a little bit longer and a little bit louder. And back in my day, we had the big CD players, mm -hmm. and so those were kind of cumbersome to wear for very long periods of time. But we're finding teenagers are wearing them much longer, and also they're hunting at much earlier ages and exposing themselves to gunfire. And so in rural areas, we're seeing a lot younger kids with noise-induced hearing loss. and with more cancers coming out, we're seeing more young adults with chemotherapy-related hearing loss. Mm -hmm. and So it's definitely gone up. Okay. How about disorders during birth? Has that stayed the same or yeah, has that it, gone up as well? Yeah, that's actually gone up as well. Um, the state of Wisconsin does mandate that all infants being born um, have to be tested for hearing. So once they're tested at the hospital, if they fail, then I get those referrals for diagnostic testing and the state of Ohio or Wisconsin, Wisconsin. <laughs> requires that we um, identify all babies that are born with hearing loss and fit them with hearing aids before the age of six months. That way that there's no um, decline in hearing or their ability to develop speech and language. So hearing loss is a significant birth defect. It's one of the highest one in a thousand babies are born with hearing loss. Okay. For our viewers at home, can you give us a general overview of how, how the ear works? How do we detect sounds, you know, the different pitches of the sounds, the, no, the noises? Sure. We have three parts of the ear, our outer ear, which you can see right here. Okay. That's shaped the way it is to gather sound into the ear. And you can have hearing loss in all the parts of the ear. And one of the examples of hearing loss that you have in the outer ear would be like a swimmer's ear or a swelling of... Um, the external ear from swimming in cold water. Mm -hmm. You can also have um, hearing loss in the middle ear section, and the middle ear includes the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, and the three bones behind the eardrum. So those are the three smallest bones in the body, if people remember from eighth grade health class, <laughs> the malus, the incus, and the stapes. And you can have hearing loss in there as well. You can have middle ear fluid that's usually treatable. Um, 
You can also have almost like an osteoporosis of the bones in the ear that fixate the bones and so they don't vibrate as well and they don't transmit sound. And that usually is surgically corrected. You can also have hearing loss in the third part of the ear, and that's the inner ear, which is the cochlea. That's that snail-shaped okay. organ that all the fine hair cells are. And that hearing loss is the most common kind of hearing loss. And um, most of that type of hearing loss we do have to correct with hearing aids. Okay. Is there a proper method that one should use in caring for their ear? promote health like do you take the q-tip and dig it way in there to clean it out or I guess what is the preferred you know for to promote the proper preferred way is to not do anything <laughs> don't stick anything bigger than your elbow in your ear okay. um, but your ear is actually a self-cleaning organ so the skin on the ear grows outward like a conveyor belt to bring out the wax and debris so that you can get it when it gets to the outside of the ear most normal healthy individuals do use q-tips and you just don't want to push those in very far um, if you do have a lot of wax, and sometimes our elderly population mm -hmm. tend to have a higher wax production, you could use over-the-counter ear wax softeners. Our doctor also recommends using just a sweet oil or olive oil at home, put a couple drops in your ear to soften the wax, and then it'll come out its own. If you have an itching ear, you can use like a hydrocortisone over-the-counter cream on a Q-tip just on the outside, mm -hmm. not on the inside of your ear. That can help with itching. Um, some people have a little bit more severe itching. can use a combination of vinegar and water and you can put drops in your ear for that. Anything more significant than that, if you have pain, you should probably see a doctor. Okay. I know I, a while back I had a massive ear, I don't know if it was an infection or just a cyst or whatever, but I couldn't hear and I couldn't do anything. And actually I went to one of the physicians and they went in and tried to get some things and sucked it out, you know, like with suction. And then he gave me some drops with the flush with the, you know, the big round, um, Bulb. bulb in the bottom mm -hmm. with the tube, and he said, put in your drops, let that, and then you flush it out with the flush as well. Yeah. If you're, if you're a healthy individual, that's not a bad idea. But if you're prone to ear infections or you have a hole in your eardrum, um, then that's probably not something you should be doing. But most healthy individuals can get by with doing that. Okay. Where does ear wax come from? Or what is ear wax? There are glands in your ear, and they're in the, just the first third of your ear. So that's why when we see wax really far in the ear, we know that wax isn't produced that far in, so we know patients have been pushing it in. So they just come from glands. It's very natural and normal to have ear wax. It's actually a protect, protective secretions in the ear. It keeps the bugs out and mm -hmm. other debris. So you do want a little bit of wax in your ear. People who overclean their ear end up getting very itchy ears and um, you can actually cause infections and abrasions in the ear canal. So that's why we generally want you to leave the ear alone. Okay. When you're on an airplane or once in a while riding high in the mountains or whatever, your ears, what they say is pop, or you got to take your nose and then to kind of pop your ears. Mm -hmm. What's causing that? That's your eustachian tube, which is the tube that runs down the back of your throat to your middle ear space. Adults don't usually have too much trouble with that because it's more vertical and up and down. Mm -hmm. And the reason children have so much ear infections is their eustachian tubes, since they haven't grown, it tends to sit a little bit more horizontal so it doesn't drain. So you have a flap in your eustachian tube that opens and closes, and that's what you hear when you hear that popping. Really? So sometimes if you have too much mucus in your sinus or the back of your throat, that flap, you'll hear it popping and crackling as it's opening. So we do recommend people popping their ears a lot to keep the airflow up there mm -hmm. so that your ear doesn't get too much negative pressure buildup. So there is a connection between your nose through the sinuses and to your ears. Yep, it's all connected in the back of your throat. Wow, I didn't know that. Other than, well, I guess, <laughs> once in a while, and if you sneeze or whatever, that, so that makes sense. Do, <clears throat> excuse me, do children still have, you know, when they're in their teens or whatever, and they're going through a huge, um, the acne stages or whatever. Is that still a big thing for in the ears as well? I know Not when I was younger, well, I was always younger and I always got, you know, big cysts or whatever in my ears. It seemed like when I was in my age when I had acne and everything. Yeah, we don't see that very often. I, no. I would say that maybe one of the biggest things is we see is eczema of the skin, which you can get anywhere in your body. And we have prescription drops that we treat with that. Okay. What are some of the other disorders one can have with the ears? I know I've had vertical and that is terrible. You know, could you tell us about that? Yeah, we actually, um, they've been doing more studies and that they have found that people who have hearing loss are three times more likely to have a fall. So we see a high association with people with hearing loss and falls. We also see a huge association, and this is new research, where um, diabetic population have 50% more likely um, chance to have hearing loss. And a lot of that has to do with that diabetic blood flow um, and overall health. You know, you have mm -hmm. very small capillaries that feed the inner ear and that supplies oxygen to the inner ear, which keeps it healthy. So a lot of diabetic patients that don't have very good uh, oxygen flow into the inner ear get hearing loss. 
We also find that in high levels with um, patients who have obesity, they have much higher risk at um, hearing loss. 70% higher risk for smokers to have hearing loss. Um, so anything, you know, even hypertension, anything yep. that affects your general health and circulation can affect your hearing. Okay. How about the environments that we work in? Can that play a role in our hearing? Yes, it can. And um, the number one cause of hearing loss is noise-induced hearing loss. And it actually is the only kind of hearing loss that's 100% preventable. So um, you definitely want to protect your ears when you're around noise. And a lot of people know to do that around factory noise. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't know to do that when they're doing recreational exposure, snowmobiles, motorcycles. We see a lot of Harley-Davidson sure. riders with high incidence of noise because the wind across their ear can reach over 120 decibels if they don't wear a helmet. Um, we also see um, other environmental aspects that can cause hearing loss would be like jet engine fuels, carbon monoxide, certain paint solvents and heavy metals. So, but noise exposure is the number one environmental cause and it is 100% treatable. Yep. I know you had mentioned earlier about hunting, you know, and things and I know years ago, like you said, you go shoot the shotgun or do whatever sighted in and you just shoot or trap yeah. shooting in the way you go. But uh, like a lot of the guns they have nowadays and the pistols are much more higher caliber. Yeah, you know, it so really just takes one shot, and yep. that, I do a lot of occupational hearing tests for some companies around, and a lot of them wonder how their hearing continues to decline even though they're wearing ear protection mm -hmm. at work. Then I delve further into their history, and I find out that they hunt, and they're like, oh, I only shoot two or three times a year, but we really want people to know that it just takes one shot, and so you really should mm -hmm. protect your ears. I know. Because it's 100% treatable, <laughs> preventable. That's preventable. why I use the bow and arrow more. <laughs> it's quieter. <laughs> Very safe. <laughs> so... Um, Along with, you know, the whole hearing is once in a while I'm in a crowded room and I find it harder too with everybody talking to understand like us having a conversation. I can't understand you because everything is just buzzing. Could you go into that or what's happening with that? With the ringing? Yeah. Yeah, um, ringing is also, it's actually a sign of hearing loss. 90% of people who have ringing in their ears also tend to have some form of hearing loss. So when we're talking about signs of hearing loss, the number one sign would be ringing. Uh, another sign of hearing loss would be people who feel like they can hear very well but um, don't hear very well at distances or mm -hmm. when people have their backs turned or when there's background noise. Um, people also who have hearing loss tend to complain that people mumble. And so um, we have a lot of people. Hearing loss usually happens so, so gradually that it just, most people don't notice it right away and just gradually they start noticing that they don't hear birds or whistles or high-pitched sounds maybe soft-spoken people too. But ringing usually is a sign of hearing loss and what usually we think is happening and there's still a lot of studies going and also a lot of studies that need to be done with ringing. There is no cure for it, but often hearing aids actually help because by amplifying the outside external sounds, it kind of quelms out your internal sounds. So we're kind of masking it over. But what people think is happening is when you have hair cell damage, which is your inner ear, you're, it's kind of like you're turning a radio station in, you're trying to find a station and you're getting static where your mm -hmm. ears are trying to receive signal across a damaged auditory pathway. So your brain is getting mixed signals and sending out signals such as hissing, ringing, chirping, humming. It's, it's different for everybody, so it's not always high pitched, but, but you should see a doctor if you have it. Okay. The other thing that people go is, you know, I used to be able to hear this, the higher pitches or the higher sounds, or like even in the woods, you used to be able to hear, you know, leaves or something way off. It's like the different pitches or the different decibel levels, how does that work? Right. Well, the most common type of hearing loss is in the higher frequency range, so that would affect your ability to hear the rustling of leaves, it would be affecting your ability to hear um, water, birds, high-pitched women's voices. Um, I have a low-pitched woman, a voice for a woman, so most people hear me really well, but some mm -hmm. elderly women <laughs> have higher-pitched voices and they have difficulty hearing. And the sounds of the alphabet that are usually higher-pitched are like the S's, the F, the TH, the CH, the P, mm -hmm. and those tend to be endings of words. So a lot of patients who have this high-frequency loss um, can hear things, but they don't understand because they're mixing the S with the F and sounds sure. that sound alike. So hearing aids can help with that too. Sure. You had mentioned it, but what are excuse me? What are some of the other signs of hearing loss that one can you know if you detect? Yeah, basically like the people who mumble, people who um, feel like they hear well but they don't understand speech. Uh, another sign would be uh, increased uh, sensitivity to loud sounds. So if a patient is bothered by um, dishes or the sound of something loud, a lot of people think hearing loss just involves not hearing anything but it also involves increased sensitivity to loud sounds, so that would be another sign. 
Is there anything you can do to filter out scratching on a blackboard or anything? <laughs> I mean, that was always one that really gets people. That's right. Actually, there is something in a hearing aid you can use for that. Really? <laughs> really? That's interesting. Um, okay. You have signs of the hearing. As far as signs of the hearing loss, what are, and we touched on it already, but what are some of the other causes of hearing that we talked about? Well, we did talk about noise exposure, which again is the 100% preventable, mm -hmm. but the other types that are not preventable generally would be aging. So as our body gets older, everything goes. The eyes, <laughs> the ears, yeah. Including hearing. Um, genetics, so some people have a hereditary component, which I do have. Um, we also have, um, I have that in my family, so that's how I got interested okay. in the field of audiology. Um, Ototoxic medication, which would be medication that is toxic to your ear, and one of the biggest things is chemotherapy treatments. Um, so a lot of these things doctors have to use to save your life, but we do mm -hmm. ototoxic monitoring in our office, so when you're on an ototoxic medication, we can follow your hearing and see how um, significantly it's affected by certain chemotherapy agents. Um, another cause of hearing loss, as we mentioned a little bit before, you know, you have a higher incidence with the diabetic and the smoking and the obesity population. Um, too many aspirins or ibuprofens if you're taking six to eight or ten ibuprofens a day for a couple weeks on end, that can definitely cause some hearing loss. So certain medications um, as well as uh, okay. cancer treatments. Cancer treatments, are there any other types of diseases, you know, like you have, there's certain um, diseases that will affect the muscles, there's certain diseases that will affect the eyes, is there certain diseases that, other, you know, you had mentioned diabetes and cancer, but earlier there are other Diseases that can, you know, yeah, affect the ears or go after? Specific ear diseases like Meniere's disease, and we were touching on dizziness a little bit. Mm -hmm. One of the hallmarks of Meniere's disease is dizziness, hearing loss that fluctuates, and ringing in the ear. So it's the big three. Um, hearing loss is uh, fluctuating, so some days are better than others. People get a sensation of fullness in the ears, and that is treatable through certain medications. Sometimes we do hearing aids on those patients as well. Um, some people can get just a viral infection of the inner ear, which I've actually experienced myself, mm. um, which patients just randomly, just like you would catch a cold, you get a little viral infection on the inner ear. Sometimes it can cause sudden severe hearing loss, and sometimes it also causes dizziness. Sometimes it just causes dizziness without hearing loss, and sometimes it causes both. So that's another uh, something that we would treat in the office. Is that what they called years ago, just a simple old earache? Yeah, it depends. <laughs> Or, you know, if simply some, someone says something, I have vertigo, a lot of yeah. times that's that. Um, there's also a positional vertigo that we see with patients that is dizziness, but there's usually no hearing loss associated with that. So when people call, um, or they call it top shelf vertigo, so people would often get dizzy when they're just in certain head positions, or they yeah. look up, or they lay in bed in a certain direction can cause dizziness, and that's something we also treat. It's probably the number one <coughs> dizziness that we see in the office. I've had that. The vertigo, like you said, and I couldn't believe it. And they, they laid me on the table. Let's rotate your head. So they started rotating my head and doing the exercise to almost. I just about got nauseous. Mm -hmm. I almost threw up, and it felt like I was going to fall off the table. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, it is. It's really interesting treatment, and people think it sounds like voodoo, but it is. Yeah, it is. Eighty percent effective in one treatment, and sometimes we have to do two treatments on someone. But we do see that a lot in our office. Yeah, I know. I got my exercises. You know, then to do at home and lay on the bed on your back on your side. And just slowly rotate your head, and you could just almost feel it when you're working it. Of yeah, yeah, I'm getting to the spot there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I didn't have that type of dizziness. I had actually a viral infection, yeah. so there's nothing you could do for that. It's that waited out. Yeah, I know what was a bummer is when I had it. I was down in Illinois on a hunting trip. Mm -hmm. Besides yet, so here I am, and just like boy, I woke up in the morning. It's like I can hardly stand. It's like there's no way I'm going to crawl into a tree. Yeah. You know, and we that see that as we get older, over 40, we, it happens a little bit more often. And once you have it, you're actually at risk for it happening again. Great. Unfortunately. Thanks for, <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. So, okay, we talked about you know some of the things. What are some of the treatments we can have? Like as you had mentioned, hearing aids. How far has the technology come from years ago to you know? Hearing aids you could see on people's ears versus now the little implants to will we ever see a bionic ear like the, you know, yeah, the bionic pretty woman? pretty much. <laughs> the hearing aids have come a huge distance in the 20-some years that I've been practicing. I remember in college adjusting hearing aids with a little screwdriver at the ear, and now we completely wirelessly program them from our computer. There's no mm -hmm. cords. We just send information from our computer. It's sent to the hearing aid. We can instantaneously make changes to address most patients' issues. So hearing aids is one of the things that we use to treat hearing loss, but in our office, depending on the cause of the hearing loss, I mean, if it's simply wax, we'll remove yeah, it. Sure. If it's an ear infection, we treat it with antibiotics or medication, a tube in the ear maybe. Um, if it's sensory neuro, which is that's when I come into play, and I treat them usually with hearing loss. So most patients will go through a trial with a hearing aid, and we try it for 60 days, see how they like it. 
and most people do like it because hearing aids, it's the only thing that will help nerve loss. It right. doesn't give you back your normal hearing because the nerve is always damaged, sure. but hearing aids have really come a long way in their noise reduction ability um, to reduce background noise. And while we're on the subject, one of the biggest things is every hearing aid has a microphone just like you're wearing. Sure. A microphone picks up sound from all directions. Well, now all hearing aids have two microphones if they're big enough. Mm -hmm. And they, that microphone picks up sound all around you, but then the second microphone will kick in to focus on sounds from the front. So that's really how we can say that hearing aids help reduce background noise, because wherever you turn your head is where the hearing aid is going to pick mm -hmm. up more sound. And even last year, there was a new technology that came out that picks up sounds from the side. So when you're not able to look at a patient or someone to talk with, like if you're in a car or you're walking, all hearing aids are focusing on the front. Well, now we have a hearing aid that once it senses speech from the side, it'll actually go into a mode where it picks up more from the side and reduces all the stuff from behind. So that's how we can help people hear better in noise. Nice. I know you Coming back to the hunting thing is some of the ear protection they have nowadays. I mean, the pair I have, I put them on, and they have little batteries, AAA batteries. You can turn them on, and it you can't believe how it enhances your hearing just in the woods wearing them. But then, you know, if you're shooting, as soon as you shoot, they automatically cut off to protect yeah. your ear. So that's really neat technology that they've come out yeah, with in the last actually, few years. Yeah, and they do have that in different levels of pricing, too. So, you know, that you can get that for $1,000 or more, and you mm -hmm. can actually get a non-custom version for probably under 100 even. So um, there's a lot of nice ear protection out that helps hunters. I know a lot of hunters don't want to wear ear protection because they want to hear the prey and they want to hear the rustling of the mm -hmm. leaves. And I do understand that, but they, they make ear protection that have filters that allow that stuff to come through. The ones you're talking about will actually amplify it or enhance it. Yep. So that's even better, but that's a little bit more expensive. But they even have less expensive filters that will allow that through, but still protect your ears when the gunfire goes off. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it comes down to years ago, like I said, it was the shotgun you went through or maybe a rifle, you know, like a 30 odd six. But now they have these high power pistols and these high power rifles that they crack so loud that. You know, one, I even shot a 44 pistol by accident, and I did, well, it wasn't, it wasn't by accident, but I didn't have my, hear, my hear, hearing protection on. When I pulled the trigger, it was like, wow, everything got quiet, and I'm looking around, and, yeah. and I remembered, oh, gee. Yeah, and you can actually get temporary hearing loss from no, noise, and you can also get permanent mm -hmm. instantaneous hearing loss. So I always kind of think of it as grass and a truck running over grass. Like if a truck runs over grass, the grass falls over, and then it comes back. So that's like one gunfire on your ear hair mm -hmm. cells falls over, you experience some fullness in your ears, a little bit of ringing and maybe some temporary hearing loss. A couple of days later, you're probably hearing better. Mm -hmm. But the more and more you're exposed to noise, the more the truck is running over that grass yep. and the less that grass comes back up. Yep. So Man that's how you end up with permanent hearing loss. Wow. What should I look for in a hearing aid? You know, is there certain functions, features, or you know, that's just what I go with, you know, with you to look at or analyze. Well, or it's important experience. to go to a provider who knows what they're doing and will give you lots of options because there are lots of options with hearing aids. Um, so as an audiologist, again, with all the college education, um, we can describe the different types of hearing aids that you might need after you describe with us the types of problems that you're having, how active your lifestyle is, where you need to hear, because every patient is different. Not only do they have a different budget, but they also may have different hearing needs based on if they're retired or they're working or they travel. So we talk a lot with the patients yeah. about what their activity levels are, what types of environments they need to hear, and then we talk about the features. But sure. I do like when a patient comes in and they're a little bit um, advert, they, you know, they've gone online and they have some really great questions about hearing mm -hmm. aids, but we don't expect you to know everything when you come in. We usually tell you what the features sure. are and if they would work for you yeah. and then we can... Well, that's why you're there. So, yeah. I mean, right. Exactly. So when I'm having hearing loss or if I'm, you know, having an issue, Am I better to go to my regular physician first and then get referred to you, or would it be just, you know, pick well, up the phone and call? Well, it kind of depends. Yeah, um, a lot of insurances do require you have a uh, referral, referral from your family doctor before you see us, so you'd have to check with your insurance. But the audiologist is the professional to see regarding your hearing, so that's who you should be sent to. Mm -hmm. But um, because your primary doctor is in charge of and kind of helps coordinate all your specialties, right. it's probably a good idea to talk to your family doctor first. Um, and also they can check for wax because sure. a lot of insurances won't cover me to remove the wax, um, even though it's in my scope of practice. But the doctor can make sure your ears are clear Correct. and then refer you to us and then we can do the hearing tests and the evaluation. Okay. Do most insurance plans cover audiology treatments? Most cover um, audiology diagnostic testing, so any balance testing that I'm doing or hearing testing. 
um, they're covering it, but not as many insurances are covering hearing aids, unfortunately, although more and more every year, are, more plans are adding insurance policy on it. So Medicare is not, which is, again, a primary population mm -hmm. that we see, but right. they specifically do not cover hearing aids, but more and more insurances are. Okay. How about, I know we're getting kind of close to the end, but surgical techniques or other techniques to help repair hearing? Well, we are starting to do a new surgical hearing aid that is, um, we're going to be the only ones offering the specific hearing aid in the county and actually within at least an hour. Um, it's called a bone anchored hearing aid and there are some facilities that do it, but we're the first to do a magnetic version of it where the doctor would, and I would start with the testing and then the doctor would do the mm -hmm. procedure in the um, surgical center where he would lift up the flap of skin, put a titanium implant on the bone, we'd close it up and a magnetic hearing aid could go on top of it and um, amplify sound. And it's really nice because it has very, very low surgical complications. It is for a very specific type of hearing loss, so um, it's not the majority of people who need that type of hearing aid, but it is really nice to be able to offer a hearing aid like that that has very low surgical complications and um, has low infection rates. Okay. How often should somebody have their hearing tested? Depending on your age, of course, at birth you start with a hearing test, and then we, we like to test your hearing at preschool, and then probably every other year until they hit middle school. And then as an adult, you should have a hearing test probably by age 50, just to get a nice baseline. And one of the things that frustrates us is we'll get somebody who has reported a decline in hearing, either after chemotherapy or after an illness or meningitis. And without having a baseline, we just don't know how much hearing loss they've had. So even if you're not having a trouble, you should have a hearing aid baseline or hearing test baseline about age 50 and then every you know, three to five years after that. Because again, we could test you every year, but we really shouldn't see much hearing change if you're pretty healthy. Okay. I know we have a couple of minutes left, so do you have any final thoughts or advice or words of wisdom for our viewers? Sure. Um, you, know, one, you know, your show is called Quality of Life, and they've done lots and lots of studies about the quality of life with hearing impaired patients, and they really are finding that patients who do not treat their hearing loss have higher tension and stress, higher fatigue, more anger, social withdrawal. They tend to not be able to remember or learn new things. They also um, tend to make less money on our working population. So it is really important to treat your hearing loss when you're aware of it because we can reverse a lot of these effects. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have social isolation, irritability. You know, it's very tiring to not hear all day. Right. So people tend to be more irritable at the end of the day. Okay. Well, Tracy, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom of audiology with us. Thank you. So it's been an honor. Um, that's our show for Quality of Life, um, Audiology. Um, if you have any questions or have any ideas for further shows, you can visit our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. And Tracy, do you have a website? We do. And for go? more information, www.prevea.com. And if you go into search and search audiology, we have a very great website that talks about all the diagnostic testing that we do and a lot of information about the different hearing aids and all the different audiology providers we have. Okay, wonderful. Well, on behalf of Tracy, uh, I'm Dave Augustine for Quality of Life, and thank you for watching.